Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the beginning of the Freshwater Stewardship Community. Uh, we are in year three of this community and we are so excited to have you here for our first presentation of the year. We are so excited to have Melissa from our Watersheds Canada team to be our first presenter this year. Mel is our Habitat and Stewardship Program Manager. And if you have any questions for her, you can drop them in the chat or you can send them to us afterwards. My name is Monica. I'm the Communications and Fundraising Manager and I will be our host for today's presentation. We also have Nicole from our staff in the chat. So she'll be helping you out with any tech issues. If you have any problems with Zoom, she can help you out. And she'll also be helping facilitate our Q&A. So a bit of introduction, because it is all about Watersheds Canada today, we'll give you a bit of overview of some of our programs. And then of course, Mel is going to go into further detail for our fish habitat program specifically. But Watersheds Canada as a whole, we are a national nonprofit and charitable organization. We focus on empowering community groups, shoreline property owners, students, and associations in leading shoreline habitat restoration projects and protecting the health of their lakes and rivers through different education and stewardship programs. So you can see a couple of examples on the slide here. In our top left, we have the Natural Edge Shoreline Renaturalization Program, which is focusing on empowering community groups and shoreline property owners to renaturalize their shorelines using native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. In the bottom left, we have our Love Your Lake Stewardship Assessment Program, which is delivered in partnership with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And this involves, as you can see in the picture, someone going around in a boat all across a water body and doing an individual assessment for each property, looking at different factors to assess how they might be influencing the health of their lake. And then each shoreline property owner is receiving a custom private report that gives them different recommendations they can take to steward the health of their lake or river. Our top right, which I won't go into too much detail, is an example of our fish habitat restoration programs, which is all about uh, today. So Mel will be talking about those later. And a final program that I'd like to highlight is in the bottom right, which is our nature discovery programming for children and youth. This is a fairly new program of ours, along with the freshwater stewardship community, which is our outreach programming. So especially during the pandemic, a lot of people were turning to nature as sort of a relief and a mental health break and reconnecting with their natural areas around them. And so our freshwater stewardship community and nature discovery programming were birthed out of that opportunity to help provide people with some tools, programs and resources so that they could safely connect with local nature. So our freshwater stewardship community, like I said, it's in year three. We first launched in 2021. So far we have hosted 22 webinars and created 16 education handouts, all of which are available online and they are archived on our freshwater stewardship community webpage. And that is watersheds.ca forward slash freshwater hyphen stewardship. Before we get into Mel's presentation, I will let you know about an upcoming webinar, which is at the end of the month. This month is our fish month, so we are highlighting different fish presenters. And so our second one will be featuring the Watershed Watch Salmon Society out in BC, and they will be talking about how we can work together to have nature-based solutions to restore salmon populations and also build resilient ecosystems in the wake of different impacts we're seeing from climate change. So if you are interested in watching that webinar, it will be taking place Tuesday, January 31st, and you can register at the same place where you registered for today's webinar. And every webinar, except for one, I believe this year is going to be recorded. So even if you can't attend presentations live, or if you have to leave early, your internet is spotty, no problem. You can always watch the recording afterwards. And in our follow-up email to you, we also send out education resources that are mentioned in today's presentation, of which Mel has many to share with you. So we will be sending you out all of the links for all of those things so you don't have to worry. If you miss something, um, you'll be getting a comprehensive email early next week straight to your inbox. 
So for today's presentation, I have the pleasure of introducing my coworker and friend, Mel. Mel joined Watersheds Canada back in 2015 after taking some time to care for her two sons and raise them at home. Mel studied natural resource management at Guelph University and ecosystem management at Sir Stanford Fleming College in Lindsay. She has previously been a very active member of Lake Association boards, where she was the water quality and lake steward for over 12 years. And she has worked at local conservation authorities as a water quality technician and a watershed monitoring supervisor. When not at home crafting, you can find Mel camping or paddling around in her kayak and always with a smile on her face, which we will get the pleasure of seeing many times as Mel talks about her passion for fish habitat restoration today. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Mel. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, one moment. Up and going. Everybody see that okay, I'm assuming. Okay, thank you so much, Monica. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to see so many people interested in creating healthy and natural habitats for freshwater fish. Um, where I am today in Perth, Ontario, uh, my kids actually have a snow day, <laughs> so they're they're curled up at home. But uh, I hope I hope you guys are all warm and cozy, and everybody's happy and healthy. And I hope you enjoy talking about fish today. So today I'll provide you with an understanding of the biological needs of common freshwater fish species in Ontario and the threats that they're currently facing. We will explore examples of successful projects for the four types of fish habitat enhancement projects. And I'll share with you some free tools to take action on your own lake or river. By the end of this webinar, you'll have a greater understanding into enhancing and restoring fish habitat in Ontario using the Fish Habitat Enhancement Toolkit and Protocols. And as mentioned, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat and I'll address them at the end of the presentation. So we hear it every day in the media, the world is being affected by climate change, Weather patterns are changing. We're seeing more flash flooding, increased precipitation and storms um, in shorter amount of time. And development is at an all time high, especially with the pandemic. We're seeing more people being able to work from home and more people are wanting to move to waterfront properties and ultimately developing those critical pieces of habitat. We've gone from seeing natural fully vegetated, healthy shorelines to this mowed lawns to the water's edge. So some of you may be asking why this is a problem. Well, this area is known as the riparian zone or the ribbon of life. It is what fish and wildlife depend on the most and it's disappearing. When asked, most property owners will tell you the number one reason they wanted to own waterfront property is because it is waterfront property. They want to swim and fish and maybe canoe or boat, and they love being able to see the water and wildlife. But many people are trying to bring the city to the lake. Um, they're cutting down the trees and planting lawns, but in the process, they're jeopardizing critical habitat and the health of land and the water. With the steady increase in development along Canada's lakes and rivers, critical fish habitat is being compromised and degraded. So we must educate people and work together to help protect our precious natural resources. And what you're seeing in this photo is an outbreak of toxic blue-green algae. It's caused by nutrient loading, an abundance of phosphorus, extremely warm fall temperatures, and no wind, the right combination to produce this deadly algae bloom. From the Hudson Bay to the Great Lakes, um, to all rivers, creeks, wetlands, and lakes in between, Ontario contains some of the most diverse aquatic ecosystems. And these ecosystems are home to many freshwater fish populations. In most bodies of water, you'll find a diverse group of invertebrates, 
vertebrate animals, and abundant populations of fish. They range from large predatory northern pike to smaller shallow water minnows in creeks and streams. And all fish species share common features. They all have gills, fins, and tails. But beyond that, there is a great variation of characteristics in many species of freshwater fish that call Ontario home. There are over 155 species of freshwater fish in Ontario. But pictured here are a few of the most common fish families that the average person may be familiar with. So we'll start off with the perch family. Um, it consists of fish such as the yellow perch and the walleye. These fish species are uh, early spring spawners. Uh, walleye is one of the most sought out sport fish and is known for its milky white eyes. They prefer to spawn at night and in fast, well oxygenated waters, either in rivers, or creeks, or on a rocky shoal. The eggs are sticky and they stick to the rocks to hold them in place until they hatch. Perch spawn, perch, yellow perch, they spawn in back bays or tributaries. They create accordion like gelatinous tubes of eggs up to seven feet long. And then you have the sunfish family. They include species such as the pumpkin seed or the bluegill sunfish. Those are the most common. But they also include species like the smallmouth and largemouth bass. These fish are spring spawners, and the males tend to dig out a nest and guard the eggs, fanning them with their tails. You may have seen a bass nest in the shallows near your dock. It looks like a circular impression in, um, in the shallows, and there's usually daddy fish there guarding, guarding the nest. These species um, also require warmer water temperatures, uh, mid to high 20s, and even some low 30 degrees Celsius during the summer months. But in the winter, they retreat to deep water where they eat very little and they wait for the spring warming. The pike family um, includes the northern pike, the muscalunge, the chain pickerel. Pike are also early spring spawners um, who prefer shallow waters with slow currents and natural cover, such as marshes and back bays with lots of vegetation. Pike don't spawn all their eggs in one place, and um, they tend to change locations through a multi-day spawn, spreading their eggs rather randomly, and then the eggs attach to nearby vegetation. Whereas with the muskie, um, they tend to choose areas with a current, less silt and vegetation, and their eggs just drop to the bottom and they do not attach to vegetation at all. A single female muskie can release anywhere from 18,000 to 200,000 eggs per spawn. These fish prefer a cool water habitat, as does the walleye, low to mid 20 degrees Celsius in the summer. And then you have the trout family. Um, they include such species as lake trout, trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, just to name a few. Um, these fish tend to be fall spawners, except for rainbow, um, and they prefer cleaner, deeper, cold water habitats, lakes and rivers that are cold and spring fed. They are a very sensitive fish um, and require higher oxygen levels and temperatures that are below 20 degrees Celsius. Freshwater fish are globally valuable yet threatened everywhere. The prevailing threats in aquatic ecosystems um, include invasive species, which may threaten fish through competition, predation, or cause habitat impacts. Some of these include zebra mussels with which filter plankton from the water, um, Eurasian milfoil, which chokes out lakes, and other invasive fish, which outcompete the native uh, species for food and habitat. Pollution is another one. Contaminants entering the water can include chemicals like pesticides and fertilizers from neighboring properties to anything like microplastics and garbage in the water. This also includes light pollution. Bet you didn't think of that one. Leaving lights on at your cottage 
or your dog at night affects nocturnal abilities. And exposing fish to artificial light at night not only makes fish more active during the night, but it also makes them emerge quicker from their hiding places during the day, which confuses them and it causes an increase in their exposure to predators. Overexploitation or overfishing, which may lead to depleted or unsustainable populations as well, um, which is why the Ministry of Natural Resource works so hard to study and manage the fisheries in Ontario and why regulations are in place. You ever wonder why there's a slot size for a particular fish on your lake? Well, it's to make sure that the smaller fish can grow up to a reproductive age and for the larger, more mature fish to be able to reproduce successfully. And of course, there's habitat alteration, degradation and loss. And this includes damage to riparian zones, removal of in-stream habitats and sedimentation and siltation of spawning beds. But it also um, includes all the other factors and lowered water quality due to increased nutrients, turbidity, salinity from road salts, pesticides and other contaminants. And it also includes impounds such as dams or weirs and improper placement of culverts. It all plays a factor. And of course, there's climate change. Climate change really affects the habitat ranges of many fish species. Uh, the warming of the lakes and the rivers is great for warm water species like the sunfish and the bass. Um, it's actually expanding their habitat ranges. But the cool water species, the walleye and the perch, are being forced um, into deeper water as um, lake temperatures increase. And decreasing their range is also an increase of competition for food and habitat. The cold water trout species um, have been also affected. Their range has to be in the areas with the coldest temperatures, preferably under 20 degrees Celsius, like I mentioned earlier, with high oxygen levels. Climate change has also affected the amount of precipitation, the duration and severity of storms. There's more flash flooding and drought events. For a fish like pike who rely on a shallow calm back bay or a seasonal wetland, um, these areas to spawn in, these areas are appearing, are not appearing now um, until April, uh, sorry, until May or June instead of April when they used to, um, when spawning used to take place. So biologists are now studying how climate change is affecting water temperatures and spawning timing. Um, in order to better manage the fish populations and the regulations. Although there are many threats to freshwater fish, one area we can really focus on is maintaining, enhancing, and restoring their physical habitats. The key is to really understand the species of fish you want to help. But this is important, and, sorry, and this is important because, as mentioned previously, each species requires a different area of habitat for different aspects of their life cycle and the time of year. Contact your local authorities, do a bit of research. Are you looking to improve the overall habitat in your lake, um, like the structures, woody debris or vegetation? Or are you noticing that age classifications are not showing any young classes of fish? Is the overall water quality changing? Is there more development in altering um, or the altering of surrounding lands? There are many things you can do as an individual or as a community to help improve local fish populations. And attending this webinar is a great start. So let's start on land. Healthy fish populations depend on healthy shore lands, not just shorelines or aquatic habitats. Throughout various life cycles, up to 90% of fish and wildlife species depend on healthy shore land. They utilize this area for sources of food, shelter, migration, breeding, and rearing of young. Now, some of you may be thinking land, fish live in the water, but many sources of food, including insects and frogs, for example, are food sources for so many species of fish. Also, when it rains, the water runs straight into the rivers and lakes if the surface is hard or impermeable. So by making a few improvements 
to the waterfront properties, we are able to decrease the amounts of pollutants and nutrients from entering the water and affecting the aquatic ecosystems. Here are some easy things you can do to improve this critical habitat. Stand on your dock. I know you've probably heard one of us say that before. Or look at your property from a boat. This is what we do in the Love Your Lake Shoreline Assessment Program. We look at your property and just look and see if there's some simple things you can do, like curving the pathway to the water and using materials that are permeable. And this will allow the water to filter into the ground instead of running straight into the lake. Planting that riparian zone with native vegetation is another great place to start. Not only does it prevent erosion because their roots hold onto the soils, they help filter the runoff using the nutrients on land before it enters the waterway. They also provide food sources and shade to the fish and wildlife species. Keeping water temperatures cooler by hanging over the water and creating that shade. And when a tree falls into the water, as long as it's not a hazard, leave it. The tree will now become amazing in water structure and it will provide habitat areas for nursery fish, areas for fish to rest and feed. Native vegetated shorelands is the easiest thing that anyone can do to restore both terrestrial and aquatic habitats. And our Natural Edge program makes it even easier. Tell Chloe Mel sent you. But if you're looking to complete a successful aquatic fish habitat restoration project, this can require a bit more planning and organization. That is why we developed the Fish Habitat Enhancement Toolkit in partnership with the Lanark County Stewardship Council. And it's based on projects that we've completed over the past several years. It provides community groups with step-by-step -step instructions on how to complete a successful fish habitat enhancement project. So some of you might be wondering, what is the fish habitat enhancement toolkit? And some of you might have been at my um, webinar when we launched this. So bear with me, a few things are repetitive, but it is a set of resources that we developed and launched just before the pandemic hit. And it provides easy to follow written guidelines and videos um, to plan and implement a su successful fish habitat project. Now, um, I've received questions about if these resources can be used in other provinces. Yes, they can. But please note that these documents do outline key authorities and permitting process here in Ontario, Canada. So you'd have to contact your local authorities in your area regarding the rules and regulations for fish habitat work before you begin. Each project protocol walks you through the project, starting with useful information about the project, planning, implementation, and evaluating your success. Um, we discuss whom to contact, key stakeholders, local authorities in Ontario, fundraising and creating a budget for your project as well as site visits and the permitting process. They also have a great resource page for your reference. Before starting a fish habitat enhancement project, you should consult our guide, which introduces different types of fish habitat projects and provides additional resources in order to complete them. Once you've identified your objectives and the type of project you are interested in, you can then refer to the protocols and videos associated with that project. These will then go into further detail and lay out the steps needed to complete a successful fish habitat enhancement project. Let's introduce you to all the different fish projects and, that we have been involved with over the last several years. So the first one is the Cold Water Creek Enhancement. Coldwater creeks are fed by groundwater and they remain cold all year. These creeks often flow during dry periods because they are not dependent upon precipitation or other surface water. Coldwater creeks are generally less than 19 degrees Celsius, even in August, and healthy creeks have native vegetation along their banks. They have fast flowing waters and habitats such as riffles, pools, and runs. With the decline of cold water creeks in Ontario due to land use development and climate change, and the fact that Lanark County now has only five cold water creeks left, there was a need to help enhance these critical brook trout habitats in our area. 
On Coldwater Creeks, our main focus has been on naturalizing the shorelines with larger native tree species, such as silver maple and black willow. By planting the shoreline or the riparian zone, we are stabilizing the creek banks and we're preventing erosion and siltation of the creek and providing shade to the creek in order to maintain and low or lower the water temperatures. We place cardboard, um, paper and fiber mats at the base of each tree to prevent competition with the surrounding grasses. And we stake and cage the trees for a few years to allow them to establish and to prevent predation from beaver or deer. Here's an example of a successful cold water creek restoration. We planted um, these silver maple trees in 2017. And in just five years, these trees are thriving, their roots are holding the soil and stabilizing the banks and filtering the runoff. They are also starting to provide shade over the creek. As these trees mature, the benefits will be incredible. It's amazing how fast these silver maples can grow in five years. The next type of project are in-water brush piles uh, or woody debris, uh, known by many different terms. Um, underwater woody debris is a healthy component of lake environments. Sunken logs, trees, branches, or root balls, they provide water uh, in-water structure that is excellent for habitat for wildlife, including fish, turtles, invertebrates, and more. Brush piles or bundles can provide fish with a food source as well as shaded areas to rest, spawn, and escape predators. They also improve water quality by reducing um, suspended sediments in the water. Beaver activity, wind erosion, or water inflows from rivers or creeks, they naturally deposit um, such woody debris into a lake. However, human activity and development have significantly reduced the amount of natural woody debris in lakes. Many shorelines get cleaned up and fallen trees are often removed from residential or cottage properties without allowing them to take hold in the lake. So communities can promote the health of fish and wildlife populations and improve water quality by creating additional woody debris habitats such as in water brush piles or bundles. After determining the need for additional woody debris and site locations are chosen, we create and deploy brush bundles into a lake. Creating a brush bundle starts with gathering local brush, tying it um, with rope that will not break down uh, by UV light or water, so it's specific rope, and anchoring it to multiple concrete blocks to ensure that they stay in place once deployed. Each bundle is placed in locations that are deeper than 10 feet or in back bay areas, so they will not create hazard. Sometimes um, we're able to access old Christmas trees and we have anchored them uh, to cinder blocks and placed them in deeper water, creating underwater forests. We then monitor the bundles during the summer for fish activity using underwater cameras and GPS coordinates that we acquired during the deployments. For this type of project, um, we worked with a local lake association and Algonquin College um, Pembroke campus, um, this was in 2021, to enhance the fish habitat of two lakes. Uh, the students spent the day with us and got to see firsthand how to restore fish habitat with woody debris. They got a chance to build and deploy their own bundles while also learning about the Natural Edge program and planting native vegetation along the waterfront. This was an amazing community project. Not only did it enhance um, the, this habitat, but we were also able to connect with the students, sharing our knowledge and experience with them. People take ownership when they're involved in the process. So make sure you reach out to your community for, if you're thinking about um, hosting your own project. As mentioned before, the third type of project is the walleye spawning bed enhancement project. So walleye, also known as pickerel, I'm not gonna go through that debate again, but they're highly prized sports fish and an important part of biodiversity in many waters of Ontario. 
If you have walleye in your lake or river, you may be able to help strengthen their populations by enhancing historic walleye spawning beds. Walleye spawning beds may need to be enhanced due to the deposit of sediment, um, silt or algae on the rocks, or due to the loss of appropriate rock from high water levels or ice movement. Walleye beds are monitored for several years and have to fit a criteria for enhancement. After acquiring the necessary work permits, you may be able to add washed river stone onto a historical uh, walleye spawning bed. These beds are then monitored, observing walleye spawning um, the following spring after the project and for years to come to see the usage and the success of the project. For this project, uh, three historic walleye spawning beds, one on this creek pictured here um, and two on Lake Shoals, all were enhanced and restored by adding additional washed river stone. Several years later, broad scale nets and creel surveys, as well as walleye counts are showing a happy and healthy walleye population on this lake now, which is including an abundance of younger class ages. This protocol outlines the steps for enhancing a walleye spawning bed during the fall. Under the right conditions, you can also do this in the winter. Um, and it's by placing washed river stone on the ice and allowing it to fall into the lake during the spring melt. So these locations have little to no current, um, can't be on a river system, um, and they allow for less machinery use and more volunteer power. For this particular project, we had the rock delivered to the local boat launch in the fall, and we tarped it for use in early February when the ice conditions were safe. We used a front loader to transfer the rock to trailers um, on multiple snowmobiles and ATVs, and we moved the rock one kilometer across the, an ice road that was plowed for this project. The location of the two spawning beds were GPSed uh, during open water, and we marked off the areas that were needed to re be restored. This area was also plowed, um, so we knew exactly where the spawning bed was. Um, and we marked the area with cedar boughs um, for safety and visibility. So people who were using the lake on snowmobiles knew that this area had a rock there and to avoid it. Um, over 50 community members from the local lake association, First Nations, Scouts Canada, and Watersheds Canada staff came together to enhance this walleye population. And I'm happy to say that during spawning, only two months later, there were walleye using both beds. The walleye spawning bed protocol includes up-to-date permitting regulations by provincial authorities and in-depth in in instructions for how to complete this type of project. The fourth type of project that I'd like to talk to you today about is the trout spawning bed enhancement project. So this is a new type of project for us that we're just in the beginning stages of development because cold water lakes are extremely sensitive and require careful planning and full support from local authorities. Studies need to be done to understand why the population is struggling and to determine if there are viable breeding class ages, uh, age classes um, of trout in the lake. So as mentioned earlier, trout require clean, cold water, um, as well as adequate spawning beds to thrive. Lake trout are a highly prized sports fish um, and an important part of the biodiversity in many waters of Ontario. So we are working to develop this project protocol to be able to help strengthen their populations by enhancing historic spawning beds. For this particular lake, the MNRF uh, local Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and local community had noticed a steady decline in the lake trout population over several years. Uh, upon study, it was noted that the historic spawning bed was covered in silt and sediment and that the stone making up the bed had been compromised. Recommendations from MNRF were, were to first wash the spawning bed using a high pressure hoses and brushes um, and we brushed the debris and silt, which were collected and were removed from the area. And this was all completed, all had to be completed before September uh, 2021. 
20, uh, September 30th because um, lake trout spawn, <laughs> the spawning season is October to early December. Um, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters Zone F, they lent us a high pressure pump and hoses and funding support was received from Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's Outdoor Fund. Part two of this project was completed in early February where we added washed river stone onto the bed. This part of the project was very similar to the walleye spawning bed that I previously mentioned, but smaller rock is required for trout. We spent the day moving and spreading the rock over the marked spawning bed that was GPSed earlier. And then the waiting game begins to see if all of our hard work will pay off. We returned to the lake once the ice had melted and we're extremely happy to see that the rock fell right into place. And now we wait again. <laughs> the hood is up to the trout and hopefully they like their new upgrade. Um, as mentioned, this project was a pilot project that we are working on and we are working on developing these protocols. So stay tuned. But it is nice to see um, the difference between the before and after here of the rock in the spawning bin. So steps to planning your own project. The overall steps are pretty straightforward and will be similar for each type of project um, th that I mentioned today. We will take a closer look at each step and I'll provide examples from the different types of projects. The first two involve many of the same partners and organize, um, many of the same partners and organizations. So number one is research, 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 research. I can't extract, I can't stress this enough. Gather all the available information on your local fishery from landowners, government and other agencies to even determine if your water body could benefit from a rehabilitation or an enhancement. A lot of the time groups want to just do a project, but you need the justification from the experts. The Ministry um, of Natural Resources, Conservation Authorities, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. They are the ones who manage Ontario fisheries and collect the fish population data. This photo actually shows an example of the Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority collecting fish population data by electrofishing this cold water creek for us to determine if brook trout are present. Um, we looked at the different population classes to determine if they were the fingerling, fingerlings, so that's a very small fish, that were stocked by the ministry, or older age classes who have continued to use the habitat. Along with electrofishing, seine nets or, and broad scale netting um, are often used by the ministry and local conservation authorities to capture local fish population data. It gives them information on the species and age classes and abundance of local fisheries. They use this data as part of their fisheries management. For example, broad scale netting is usually completed every five years on certain lakes. And if they see uh, walleye populations are decreasing or no young age classes, they can use that information to study the spawning beds closer. Fish counts during spawning are often conducted as well. Comparing the number of fish observed each year provides the data um, to determine if the spawning beds are in need of an enhancement or a restoration. The MNRF um, keeps track of the historical spawning beds. Uh, walleye and trout often return to the same bed year after year. So these counts are great indicators of the overall health of a population. The simple act of collecting and monitoring water temperatures in multiple locations will also give you a lot of information about a water body. Cold water creeks, for example, are fed by groundwater and they remain cold all year. These creeks often flow during dry periods because they're not dependent upon precipitation or other water, uh, other surface water. Cold water creeks are generally less than 19 degrees Celsius. By recording water temperatures during the summer, you're able to determine if it is actually a cold water habitat, or by using multiple locations, you can determine if there's a specific area that needs some help. Contact your local conservation authority if you have one. Um, they may already be, be collecting temperature data and monitoring the water body with data loggers. 
Number two, consult key stakeholders. As mentioned in the last step, partner with as many groups as possible. The MNRF, CAs, the Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Watersheds Canada, local stewardship councils, fishing game clubs are a great resource, lake associations, um, First Nations groups, local residents. You want to involve everyone. When, when all the partners are at the table, the success of the project increases drastically. This remains the same for every type of project and also make sure to contact your local landowners and obtain permission to access project locations. Determining your objective from the research you have already done, what is the issue or what is the problem affecting the fish? So healthy fish populations depend on many factors, like I mentioned earlier, food availability and structural habitat. These factors are often largely impacted by human activities. Alterations in development along shorelines can damage fish habitat, reduce the fish populations, as mentioned earlier. There are many things that people can do to enhance and restore these habitats and improve their local fisheries. Um, aquatic vegetation, such as water lilies and emergent plants, such as bulrushes and cattails, are key habitat features for small fish and amphibians. Many people remove these plants as they want to want like a beach like swimming area near their property. However, by pulling these weeds, um, shoreline property owners are directly destroying primary habitat. The aquatic vegetation is important for fish and wildlife species as it is used for shelter to escape predators and protection from the sun and a food source. So let's look at a few examples of data collected from site visits from our partners. Uh, we learned that this cold water creek has brook trout from electrofishing data. From a site visit, we learned that there are areas that do not have trees on the bank and there is also bank erosion. And from the water temperature data that we collected, this area is much warmer at 23 degrees Celsius than the upstream area where it was only 15 degrees Celsius. Our objective for this area would be to restore the area by planting native trees like black willow and silver maple, both fast growing and require wetter habitats. And this will stabilize the shoreline and provide shade to the creek, decreasing the, the water temperatures and increasing the area of preferred habitat for the brook trail and, and increasing their range. This creek has been flagged by the local outdoors club and by the um, MNRF as a historic walleye spawning bed. Data has shown that the local walleye numbers um, at, at spawning have decreased. And from the site visit, we observed that there is not enough rock. And what is there is all covered in silt. So the objective for this project is to add more washed river stone in varying sizes, 10 to 20 centimeters in diameter to this location. And the key thing to note is that you must use washed river stone. Um, we're not, we don't wanna add silt and dirt back into the water. And that is key. And another example would be underwater footage collected on this lake has shown us that there are areas where there's very limited vegetation or woody debris. So after consulting with local authorities, we learned that the broad scale netting was showing a decrease in the abundance of fish being caught. Development had also increased on this lake. So it was decided that our objective would be to work with the community to add brush bundles to a dozen sites on the lake in order to restore and enhance this habitat. Choosing a location is based on many factors, depending on the type of project, whether it is a historic a historical spawning bed location, an area where vegetation has been removed or is lacking, an area that does not have woody debris nearby or simply accessibility to an area. Talking with your stakeholders and partners will allow you to choose the best location for your project. Making sure to include the local landowners and getting permission to access property is also, um, if needed, is also a priority. Site visits are a very important part of the process. Use the local knowledge of property owners, the local fishing community and experts to determine which areas would best suit a restoration. When choosing a staging location, 
that allows you and fits your needs, okay? Public boat launches are often a great space to stage your project. Uh, remember that besides the actual area to be restored, you need an area that allows for equipment access, parking for volunteers, space to have rock delivered, um, and boat launches tend to be a great area if they're big enough. So you will also need permission from municipalities in order to use those spaces. Planning your project and obtaining official permits. Um, this step is critical for the success of your project. Like I mentioned earlier, each project is unique and involves different partnerships. But the key point to realize is that fish habitat projects take time. They take time to research, they take time to plan, time to execute. They do not happen overnight. And the more pe people realize this, the more successful the project can be. You need to plan out when your project will take place. This often depends on when um, certain species are spawning and when um, in the water work is even allowed. How long will it take? How many volunteers you'll need? What materials and equipment are needed? As well as creating a budget for your project. So projects are easy. Some projects are easier than others. Um, brush bundles or planting trees are not as involved as a spawning bed restoration. Planning also involves applying for the necessary permits for in-water work um, from the MNRF, from the CAs, and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And this process becomes easier if you've been working with them right from the beginning. They, they're aware of your project, so they know that this is coming. And sometimes they can even um, expedite it a little bit. But it can take several months to complete and to acquire them. So make sure that you apply early. As previously mentioned, you need to figure out a budget for your project and how you will fund it. Are you going to apply for a grant, um, acquire donations from a local business or from a sponsor? Some projects like brush bundles require more volunteer time than, and less money, whereas restoring a spawning bed can be quite pricey when it comes to purchasing rock or renting equipment or contractors. Also, ask your local contractors um, you'd be surprised how excited they could be to help out with a worth, worthwhile project. On your screen now is um, Leva, uh, Levanture Construction and M. Sullivan and Son, who donated equipment and time to help us restore three historic walleye spawning beds on White Lake. All of these projects that I mentioned today were possible because of strong community support, both from volunteers and donations. Watersheds Canada is a small nonprofit that does not receive any yearly government funding and has to fundraise for each project to ensure that they are a success. You can help us start 2023 strong for upcoming fish habitat restoration projects by making a tax receivable donation at watersheds.ca slash donate. The final step is just as important as the work itself, communicating and sharing what you have done in an extremely important is an extremely important part of the process. Funders want to know what you have done um, and want to be recognized for their support and contributions to your restoration. And community partners are excited to share the great news. Being a part of a fish habitat restoration is fulfilling. It is great to know that you are doing something good for the local fish and the wildlife in your area. Creating videos, sending out media releases to local news sources and sharing, on social media are just a few ways that you can show your appreciation to your funders and partners. So always remember to take lots of photos and video of your process, document befores and afters, and make sure you return to your sites to monitor the success of your projects. I know there's a lot of information that I haven't covered. I could actually talk about each of these projects for probably a few more hours. But, so if you're looking for more details, please refer to our protocols. And I highly encourage you to watch the three accompanying videos. Each video is under 10 minutes and gives an overview of what is involved with that type of project, as well as demonstrating how they can be done. The videos were created by Pine Grove Productions and are available on both Watersheds Canada website and our YouTube channel. 
In Watersheds Canada, we believe sharing our resources, expertise, and programs um, allows us to make the greatest improvement to freshwater health across Canada. When we teach you how to help, we give you the power to pass on that same help to others. Thank you for joining me today um, to learn about creating healthy natural habitats for freshwater fish in Ontario. Everyone is muted, so I'll give you the, the clapping. <laughs> Great job, Mel. Thank you so much for sharing all that information. We have a survey link going in the chat right now. Nicole's going to pop it in there if you can let us know what you thought of Mel's presentation today. And also, if you have any further questions or topics you'd like us to explore in the 2023 webinar series, you can put that in there too. It's all anonymous, so please put as much information or questions as you have. We do look at those surveys and use them to guide our future programs. But we do have about 10 minutes here for question and answer. People have been putting their questions in the chat throughout the presentation, but if you've been saving your question, now is the time to put it in there. But we'll just start from the beginning. So Mel, how long do you expect the spawning ground upgrades to last before you have to re-wash them or re-rock them? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, everyone is unique, so it's kind of hard to answer those questions. I know from ones that I have seen done in 2011, they're still good. Um, and they're just starting, like, for example, <clears throat> the Lanark County Stewardship Council restored walleye spawning beds on Mississippi Lake back in 2011. And we are now starting to see the different age classes of walleye and the walleye population is taking off, which is fantastic. Um, it all depends on land use and development around those 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 water bodies, um, whether things are silted over again, if people are starting to make improvements along their shorelines and are taking care that way, the longer these walleye beds can last. Great, and someone else is asking, this is maybe gonna be a per case basis, but someone is asking yeah. what is the necessary water depth for a spawning bed for trout or walleye? Okay, um, it varies again uh, from lake to lake, but uh, when we were working on that particular trout spawning bed, we were up to our, standing on the bed, we were up probably up past our knees. Um, again, it depends on the location um, and the shoal. The, the, the basics is that you need so many feet of water, obviously, um, but you need that current. You need the oxygenation of the water and the moving of the water on that um, spawning bed. So uh, that's why walleye, that's what um, spe uh, walleye spawn in the spring when the water is a little bit higher and there's a rush of water on some of the creeks that they spawn on. Um, so again, it depends on the actual site I think I'm going to give you one more where it's going to be a case by case, but what is the typical width of shoreline required for the spawning beds? Okay. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's just, it's each, each walleye bed or each spawning bed is unique. Um, I've had some that were quite small, um, like you saw that river picture where it was a narrow creek. Um, and then I've had others, uh, like our trout bread bed was like 50 feet across. So each, each habitat is unique. Um, it depends on the resource, the natural resources that are available on that lake, how big that shoal is. Um, so each one is totally different. And if you are in Ontario and you have questions, I know Mel is more than happy to help people find information. If you're overwhelmed about what your first step is, Mel is definitely a resource and she is always very excited to help people out and get those projects started. So you can always email her as well. We have a question here, which I'll expand not to just the province that was mentioned, but if people aren't based in Ontario, do you know where their starting points could be to start the research and information collection stage? 
Yeah, so uh, depending on what province you're in or where you're located, um, your local authorities. So whoever's looking after your fisheries, whoever is looking after um, your local water regulations, um, those are great starting points. Um, that's where I always start when I'm researching. Um, I, I contact local conservation authorities, fish and game clubs, the, um, the local ministry, even Fisheries and Oceans Canada is a great one. Um, those are always your best bets. For the trout spawning bed project specifically, the question here is, did you or how did you filter out the silt when you were cleaning the bed? So we had up um, a silt curtain and we were, with the pressured hoses, we were forcing the silt into the curtain and then removing the curtain. Um, we also brushed off a lot of vegetation um, and algae from the rocks. Those were all hand removed and placed up on land. Um, everything was disposed of at, up at, on land so that we wouldn't affect any other parts of the habitat. Great. There's a question wondering if we've done any habitat projects in front of steel seawalls. I have not. No. Um, I'm not too familiar with that, unfortunately. That's okay. And I think our last one here in the chat is if you've come across any articles associated with snow melts or ice cover in relation to fish habitat oxygenation. Um, I have not personally seen any. It doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, it's definitely something that we could look into for sure, but probably local universities or there's got to be some studies out there um, being conducted for sure. Okay, we have a few more questions in a few more minutes, so we'll sneak them in. Um, someone's just asking for more clarification for when we were sweeping off the rocks. So we, well, I mean, I can answer this. We were just using regular brooms that you would use in the house to sweep them off and then uh, removing the algae by hand, like Mel said. Mm -hmm. um, what might you give as advice for lake association groups that are seeing docks that are degrading and seemingly have no owners? Hmm. Well, that's tricky because once things become part of the ecosystem, it's worse to actually remove them than it is uh, to leave them. They, if a, if a dock is starting to rot apart and it has been embedded into that um, shoreline, it's now become fish habitat. Um, fish are using it as shelter. So it can be tricky to remove um, abandoned docks. So it would definitely be something you may have to call a local authority on. Someone is wondering if any of our projects have involved environmental DNA kits. No, that would be interesting. I personally haven't used them. Okay, and then our last one is just asking if we do partnerships with First Nations groups. Yes, yes, for sure. We, um, like the, I said, that one walleye bed that we did, uh, we had a local the local First Nations group um, joined us. Uh, we had 15 members and uh, it was fantastic. Even hearing about the populations um, from years ago from local residents. It, it's, it's interesting to see how the populations have changed um, and how the land has changed. And um, so, like I said, involve everybody in these projects. Great. I don't see any more questions. So um, thank you so much again, Mel. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Don't forget to answer that quick survey for us so that we can 
know how we did today and also if you have any pressing issues that are happening on your lake or river and you want us to host a webinar about it that's the place to put it otherwise you can expect an email from us early next week which will have the recording from today's presentation and a handout that summarizes all of the resources and the key points that Mel made today. You are welcome to share the handout and the recording widely with anyone and everyone you know who might be interested in using these resources. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions about a specific project, especially if it's in Ontario, you can reach out to Mel and her emails on the screen, uh, dakers at watersheds.ca. So thank you everyone so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.